welcome to medical corner today we are going to start our uh, next very important topic of special pathology which is endocarditis so starting with its definition so endocarditis it is the inflammation of endocardial layer of the heart as we know the heart consists of three layers number one endocardium which is the innermost layer of the heart second one is myocarditis and the outermost is pericarditis inflammation of all three layers of the heart is known as pancarditis but the inflammation of innermost layer of the heart which is endocardium is known as endocarditis so we move on to its history so in history endocarditis is one of the challenging and difficult conditions for general physicians as well as cardiac phys physicians previously it affects ages less than 30 and 40 years but now endocarditis mostly affects ages above 50 years and male to female ratio is 2 ratio 1 although it is uncommon in children and infants nowadays it is very uncommon disease nowadays uh, as we know there is invention of antibiotics and we have a wide range of antibiotics right there so it is nowadays uncommon disease but it is not rare so now we move on to its predisposing factors so the number one factor is artificial heart valves or prosthetic valves prosthetic valves are one of the most important target for the bacteria to develop endocarditis second one is congenital heart defects we discuss all the congenital heart defects in very detail i will put the link in the description below kindly check them out third one is history of endocarditis fourth one is chronic iv excess some patients have chronic iv line uh, due to various problems so bacteria can pass through their uh, systemic circulation and can uh, uh, reach the heart and develops endocarditis fifth one is any dental history any uh, history of dental surgery as we know non-sterile dental instruments can pass infections so dental history is one of the most important history which should be taken in the endocarditis and last one is age more than 60 years so these are the some predisposing factors of endocarditis now we move on to its classification so there is very simple classification one is non-infective and second one is infective endocarditis in non-infective endocarditis there is no role or no penetration or no involvement of the bacteria but in infective endocarditis there should be bacterial involvement so if we talk about non-infective endocarditis uh, the types are rheumatic endocarditis we talk about uh, rheumatic endocarditis in detail in rheumatic heart disease lecture so i will also put uh, the link of uh, rheumatic heart disease uh, in the description below kindly check it out second one is Libman sex endocarditis third one is non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis so these are the three conditions in which there is no bacterial involvement and uh, that's why they are known as non-infective endocarditis the most important is infective endocarditis in infective endocarditis we have two subclassifications now one is bacterial endocarditis due to the environment of the bacteria and second one is viral for infections fungal infections are due to the tuberculosis so this is all about the introduction of endocarditis now we move on to its detail so starting with non-infective type of endocarditis so the first one is Libman sex endocarditis so if we talk about Libman sex endocarditis it is non-infection related endocardial inflammation so, so in Libman sex endocarditis there will be no presence of bacteria so then what is Libman sex endocarditis it is autoimmune induced endocardium problem and the most common condition in which there is autoimmune induced endocarditis is systemic lupus erythematosus so what are the morphological features so as we know the most common valves which are affected in different heart disease is mitral valve left heart left heart is most commonly targeted due to the increased workload and increased mechanical stresses 
so uh, if we talk about its morphology there are small multiple granules which are present on the edges of the valve and these nodules or granular substances can be present both in atria and the ventricles of the left heart these are usually sterile non infected and these non infective lymphatic sacs granules can be used by the bacteria to develop bacterial endocarditis and the most common condition which develop when these sterile granular substances are triggered by the bacteria are regurgitation so if we talk about the microscopy of these granular substances so there will be presence of necrosis right there increase in capillary permeability there are presence of lymphocytes and plasma cells but the most most important distinguishing feature is there will be no presence of eschcov bodies in lymphatic sacs granules and there will be no presence of eschcov bodies in lymphatic sacs endocarditis so the second one is non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis so in non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis it is clear from the name that it is non bacterial and there is presence of thrombus so these are the sterile thrombotic vegetations patients uh, as we know some patients have hypercoagulable states they have the chances to develop the thrombus or emboli and there are some pupils which have carcinomas of the mucous membranes there are some patients which have the carcinomas of the mucous lining of different organs so whenever there are hypercoagulable states and there will be and there is problem with the mucous membranes so there are increased chances of developing of non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis as we know when there is problem with the mucous membrane so there will be disturbance in the endocardial lining so whenever there is disturbance in the endocardial lining so there is presence of thrombus right there and it is a normal physiological phenomena so non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis number 1 it is uh, present in the patients with hypercoagulable states or the patients having carcinomas of the mucous membranes third one is some patients having deep vein thrombosis so uh, fourth one is there is history of endocardial trauma all these condition leads to the disturbance of endocardial lining so whenever there is disturbance in the endocardial lining there will be thrombus formation so if we talk about its morphology there is single brownish granular substances along the line of cloyer of the leaflet so these brownish granules are easily friable so they can be easily detached from that surface and they can travel in the systemic circulation so if we take a, a talk about the microscopy there is presence of fibrin right there presence of rbcs wbcs and platelets right there as it is sterile thrombotic endocarditis so that does not cause any tissue destruction or there will be no signs of inflammation right there so this is all about the non infective endocarditis and it includes two condition number one lebman sacs endocarditis which is autoimmune induced second one is non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis which is due to the disturbance in the endocardial lining now we move on to our next topic which is infective endocarditis so in infective endocarditis there is involvement of the bacteria so as we know the heart in a structure consists of valves and the walls and the lining of the atrium and the ventricles so whenever we talk about the endocardium it means all the inner things which are present in the inside of the heart so inside of the heart there is presence of valves and there is presence of lining of the atrium and ventricle so infective endocarditis it is the infection of valvular and mural endocardium both valvular and mural endocardium both are infected and caused by different microorganisms or different bacteria um, some of the important bacteria or the most common uh, bacteria which can cause infective endocarditis are virden streptococci staphylococcus gonococci strep pneumonia h influenza and lot of other bacteria which can cause the infective endocarditis 
so uh, moving on to its epidemiology as we talk about in our intro that antibiotics increases the incidence of endocarditis but now the infective endocarditis incidence is increased in elderly pupils due to the low immunity and low tolerance of the microorganisms or the bacteria and usually infective endocarditis is secondary to the rheumatic fever and males are more affected than females in case of infective endocarditis now if we talk about the predisposing factors of endocarditis number one is bacteremia septicemia or pyemia so the there are various conditions which can lead to all such conditions so number one is dental infections as we know the dental history is most important in any type of bacterial inflammation or in any type of disease dental infection is most common so the conditions which can lead to the dental infections during uh, tooth extraction or vigorous brushing there is damage of endocardial lining and uh, the bacteria can enter into our blood stream can cause bacteremia septicemia and pyemia so dental infection is top of the list and the most important predisposing factors second one is genito urinary infections whenever there is catheterization or cystoscopy there is uh, there is a um, lot of way for the opportunistic bacteria to enter our blood stream and cause different inflammations and infections third one is infections of git and biliary tract then surgery of bowel and biliary tract any surgery either it is dental or either it is medical any surgery can lead to the infective endocarditis as we know in surgery open wounds can increases the chances of bacteria to enter into the human body and cause infections next one is skin infections like abscesses uh, last one is uh, upper respiratory tract infections and lower respiratory tract infections and iv drug abuse all are the predisposing factors which can enters bacteria into our blood stream now the second one predisposing factors are underlying heart disease as endo infective endocarditis is a heart problem so underlying or already present heart disease can provoke the infective endocarditis so the number one condition in a uh, heart disease is chronic rheumatic valvular disease in 50% of the cases of invo 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 infective endocarditis there is history of chronic rheumatic valvular disease second one is congenital heart disease and the history is present in 20% of the cases and the last one these are prosthetic heart valves or floppy mitral valves so these are the heart conditions which can lead to the infective endocarditis and the last one is impaired host defenses as we know there are various conditions which weakens the immunity of the person so whenever there is weaker weakness in the immunity so bacteria can attack that person easily so the conditions which can lead to the impaired host defenses or lymphomas or the leukemias or uh, cancer therapy or the deficient functions of immune system neutrophils and macrophages so now we talk about the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis so the pathogenesis is very easy and simple as we know uh, turbulence of the blood flow can damage the endothelium which can result in the exposed collagen and other material whenever there is turbulence of blood flow it can damage our endothelium and whenever there is damage to the endothelium the collagen and other cellular materials are exposed which leads to the adhesion of platelets and the fibrin and forms thrombosis so whenever there is damage to the endothelium there is platelet and fibrin adhesion and there will be thrombus formation now when this thrombus is there on the valve leaflets or in the mural endocardium the bacteria can easily attach attach their cells to the thrombus so whenever there is thrombus formation in the heart valves so opportunistic bacteria is invade and they can attach their cells to the thrombus and they lodged on to the non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis and form vegetations let's take example this is already present thrombus for example 
So let's take this example. This is thrombus formation anywhere in the heart and this is the bacteria. So the normal bacteria are the less virulent bacteria are killed by our immune system and the bacteria which bypasses our immune system uh, the most favorite target for the bacteria to adhere themselves is the thrombus. So this is the bacteria and there is already present thrombus right there. So this bacteria can adhere to this thrombus and forms vegetations on the leaflets and these vegetations can lead to the bacterial contamination right there is so there will be bacterial contamination one bacteria can lead to the entry of the other bacteria uh, right at their targeted location and there will be more more and more bacteria right there and huge vegetation right there uh, at that specific location so the second one is circulating bacteria is lodged on the previously damaged heart valves that's uh, next one is hemodynamic stresses uh, as we know the hemo hemodynamic stresses can damage endothelium and damage endothelium can lead to the adhesion of bacteria right there. The next one is non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis which we have already discussed. If we talk about the microscopy of infective endocarditis, the most common valve which is involved in the endocarditis and the rheumatic heart disease it is the mitral valve. The next one which is infected is the aortic valve. Mitral valve is affected in round about 70% of the cases of infective endocarditis. And when we take these vegetations and we put them under the microscope, so these vegetations appear gray to greenish, irregular and typically friable. So uh, these vegetations consist of three zones. Let's say this is the vegetation. So it consists of three zones. Number one is the outer layer the uppermost layer which is consist of fibrin and platelets. The platelets role is to adhere more and more bacteria, more and more platelets right there and increase in the size of vegetation which can lead to the floppy valve and damage to the that atrium or that ventricle. Now the second zone or the second layer is the basophilic layer in which there is heavy contamination of bacteria. Third one is the deeper zone in which there is presence of lymphocytes and other basophil basophilic material. Now we move on to the complications of infective endocarditis. As we already discussed, the complications and the incidence of infective endocarditis is decreased nowadays due to the infections, uh, due to the invention of antibiotics. Now it is very uncommon, but it is not rare. So the cardiac complications which can occur in the infective endocarditis. So number one is valvular stenosis. As we know, whenever there is vegetation, there is stenosis of the valve. Second one is rupture of valve leaflets. When there is huge vegetation right there on leaflet, so there will be increased chances of valve rupture. Third one is abscess in the valve ring. Whenever there is vegetation, there is bacteria, there are increased chances of pus formation. Next one is suppurative pericarditis. And the last one is heart failure. It is the last stage of the infective endocarditis when the vegetations can hijack the heart musculature and which can lead to the heart failure. The extra cardiac complication includes the emboli, which can detach. The, for example, if it is this is the vegetation and it is highly friable, so one part of the thrombus can detach from here and enter into the systemic circulation and get lost into the pulmonary circulation can cause pulmonary edema and the pulmonary failure. Next one is petechial hemorrhages on the skin. Uh, next one is the oslo nodes which are the painful tender nodes on the palms and the sole surfaces. Next one is glomerulonephritis. Whenever there is thrombus and the bacteria is enter entry into the kidney, they can cause glomerulonephritis. And the last one is eyes. In the eyes, the symptom of the infective endocarditis is the root spot which is the localized red spot in the corneal area. So this is these all these are the uh, complications of the infective endocarditis. Now there are the less important types of the infective endocarditis and the organisms are tuberculosis endocarditis in which the uh, causing agent is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Next one is fungal endocarditis.
when there is involvement of the fungus and the last one is viral endocarditis which is quite rare now if we talk about the signs and symptoms of the infective endocarditis as it is the bacterial infection so fever is the most common sign next one is anorexia as it is a bacterial infection anorexia is there weight loss is there malaise is there night sweats are there two things which are very important in infective endocarditis number one is fever and second one is heart murmur next one is petechiae on skin and fingers genital lesions these are the blackish spots on palms and soles which are co quite uh, which are the quite similar to that of the embolic phenomena small small embolus are present on the palms and the sole surfaces which are known as genital lesions splinter hemorrhages under the uh, finger or the nail beds uh, oslo nodes we already discussed about it in the root spots these all these are the minor and the major criteria to diagnose the infective endocarditis so the investigations which we have to carry out is the blood culture to glow bacteria and nowadays due to the infection of the broad spectrum and the targeted uh, antibacterials which we can grow the bacteria on the blood agar or the chocolate agar and we target that specific bacteria so the blood culture are the important one second one is eco to uh, study the valve movement and to study the endocardium so in investigation blood culture and eco both are the important and if we talk about its treatment if it is uh, in the initial stages antibacterials show good prognosis and if it progresses then surgery is required to treat the endocarditis or the infective endocarditis so this is all about the infective endocarditis and non infective endocarditis see you in the next video thank you